yeah. So, hey, Zach, I want to say, th- first of all, thank you for coming on. I, um, I, it's been such a long time since we talked, and uh, I know um, you've done such great things in your career that I, I couldn't wait to get you on because I know that, uh, you know, we kind of started off, we all I kind of had a similar <clears throat> career. I mean, we were both in Germany, I think at the same time, I want to around the same time, and mm-hmm. uh, both were at the Rangers, and then, but then you kind of like, went on a different trajectory and you started like really excelling. And I, I thought that was really awesome. And uh, like I said, I can't, I can't thank you enough for coming on the podcast. And um, yeah. So uh, I guess what, I, what I'd like to do, if I could just start off with, um, you know, what got you interested in the military? Like tell me about a little bit about your, before that you got in the military, what prompted you to join and we'll just kind of go from there. Yeah, absolutely, man. Uh, a little bit about my background from Chattanooga, Tennessee. A lot of people love that, that scenic city. Yeah. Uh, but I grew up in uh, downtown and the West Side Projects and, uh, you know, went to all black school, uh, all black neighborhood. And years later, my mom got remarried and we moved from Chattanooga, Tennessee to Jasper, Tennessee, population like 3,600, very small. Mm-hmm. So so I went from being the uh, the majority minority to the minority minority. Right. So now <laughs> I'm in all white school, uh, all white town. And again, it's not good or bad. It's just different. Right. So sure. Sure. You, you change your environment, Mr. Set. And. You know, there everyone worked at the foundry or the local, you know, uh, local facility for uh, uh, for work. And I was like, man, I don't want to stay around here and, you know, just look for the next new truck or new bass boat. And that's it. Uh, I wasn't a great student not because I wasn't smart. I just didn't care. Right. So, yeah, I know. What me. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> what, what can I do besides get out of here? You know, but be productive. And, uh, you know, I saw the uh, Marine Corps commercial. Uh, I saw a Marine fighting dragons with fire swords and I knew fire swords didn't exist. I knew dragons didn't, did not exist, but look pretty cool. So I, right, go, right. Right? <laughs> so I actually uh, delayed enlisted uh, for the Marine Corps. And then uh, before I signed the paperwork to, uh, you know, fully commit, uh, you know, fat air force staff sergeant got a hold of me and uh, told me about this thing uh, called CCT and TAC P and PJ and the rest is history. So yeah. not, not by design at all, it's by default I kind of stumbled into it for sure. So did you, um, when you got, did you have a guarantee going into basic or did you have to like try out when you went to basic or how'd that work for you? Yeah. So, you know, back when we joined, you had to have a, a regular AFSC because of the washout rate or probably just the lack of understanding how it worked. So, right. um, my, my job was F-16 crew chief. That's okay. my guarantee job in Air Force. <laughs> uh, you know, so when I fill out attack P, I can go to F-16 crew chief, but luckily I didn't do that. So, Right. Yeah, uh, actually, a good friend of ours, like Nick DePago, we're in the same uh, basic training class. Oh, so, no kidding. Yeah, yeah. So about that? that's the longest uh, person I've known in the military, you know, day one, um, whatever flight I was in, you know, yeah. Nick DePago and I was in the same class and, you know, he served with the Rangers with us as well. So, you know, small yeah, world. yeah. Did you guys go to tech school together as well? Absolutely. Yeah. Same, oh, okay. same class. Yeah. Oh, no, yeah. That's so, cool. Basic training and, and I went out to tech school and. We both went to Germany. Oh, really? <laughs> you know, yeah. And then uh, for Germany, I went to Bragg. I think he stayed in Germany a little bit longer than we both end up, ended up at the Ranger Battalion, the Ranger Regiment. And I was yeah, at, yeah. Uh, he was at 375, I think. And I was at 275. Yep. So, yeah, he was at 375 with us. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's just, uh, so he and I, we go, we go way back from, from day one. <laughs> nice. So um, when you got out of tech school, you said, did you go straight to Germany from there? That was your first assignment? Or did you go somewhere first uh, out of tech school? Uh, no, I went straight to Germany. So, okay. you know, I was in the airborne program, you know, you have to compete, you know, the best yeah, fitness yeah. guys. And, and so I was in that program and that's back when I was a lot slimmer, uh, <laughs> about, about 162, you know. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Same height, you know, 6'3", 162. Uh, wow. I was relatively fast, you know. I, I yeah. remember uh, one of my two mile runs in tech school was like uh, 1156 or something like that, you know. That's smoking. Yeah. Yeah. Don't ask me to do that now, man. I, no, no way. Yeah. Me I'm too. Kind of provider. I couldn't do it, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but you know, the airborne program's like, Hey, you know, you gotta give up your, your assignment to Germany for a potential airborne slot and potentially go to Fort Bragg. I'm like, mm, Germany airborne. I heard some good things about Germany. I'm going to, I think I'm going to try this Germany thing out and I try to do airborne later. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Went straight to Germany. I'll say yes. Uh, non-military but just a, a perspective wise being 18 years old in a foreign country you know coming from the demographic i was telling you about yeah uh, in that small town joined the air force now i'm in europe and on my own and like wow this is awesome you know got my uh bug for traveling you know i'll start traveling and then i'm at 52 countries now 
But I would say that that, you know, sparked a lot of things and shaped my worldview on how I see things. And so I think those two great choice. But but then follow up went to Fort Bragg, went to Airborne School anyway. So it was, it was the right choice. Right, right. Yeah. I think that's pretty forward thinking. That's for an 18 year old to think like, I, yeah, I could do this. I could go to North Carolina. But then, you know, to, to have that foresight to think about how Germany would be kind of like a uh, like a life broadening kind of a, a decision. I mean, that's pretty forward thinking of you. Yeah. I wish I had that master design, you know, that grand design plan, you know, sitting back there, you know, with the pipe, you know, right. I was like, I was like, man, Germany sounds pretty cool. I've never been there before. Let's go. You know? so. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. So how, how was that for you? How was you, you were with, um, where were you in Germany? Where, where'd you get stationed? There? I was in that Würzburg. So Würzburg, Germany, second okay. ASOS at the time. Okay. Uh, it's now, I think in Vilsack, but yeah, second ASOS, a uh, great city. Uh, Versburg is probably about an hour and a half hour south of Frankfurt, just for reference point. You know, it's closed out okay. now. It's called Lake and Barracks. Uh, but man, I had great, great supervisors, man. Um, you know, I, I say my life has been a bunch of contrast, comparing contrast. The reason why I started out with the story from, you know, growing up in a quote unquote hood to growing up in rural America, uh, I'll find, you know, discernment comes from the details and the differences. If you look at something, you look at the differences. That's where you find your discernment. And so just having those two environments early on before 18 shaped my worldview as well. Then going to to Germany shaped my worldview as well. And then within our career field, back when we came in, I would say we probably had, it was one career field on paper, but it's probably about four sections. We had the armor guys who was death before dismount. Right. We had the, uh, the 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 infantry guys, right? We had the yeah. airborne, and then we had the soft, right? And right. no one cross talked, you know, within this career field. It was, you know, yep, them against us, and yeah, a lot and, of animosity that didn't need to be there for sure. Yeah, it was crazy. I look at I look at it now, and it's non-existent. That's good, but I yeah. remember those times, and and uh, I remember when I told my sergeants in in, in Germany I want to go to Fort Bragg. I'm like, man, those guys know how to do casts. This jump boys and this, 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 right? And and I would say those uh, armor guys in Germany, they weren't all the cool, sexy badges and everything, but yeah. those dudes knew close air support. For sure. For sure. For I sure. mean, yeah. those, those ins and outs and major combat operations. And Definitely. I think I was a uh, decent Ranger JTAC because of being a good, uh, you know, Romad if you, back in the day for right. armor and mechanized infantry. I mean, that was the foundation, right? For sure. Uh, but but looking at those, you know, the the the, the differences is, you know, comparing contrast the two. And I remember I think it was Harris when I got on the phone, it's like, where are you coming from? I told him, he goes, Hey, don't be one of those fat armor dudes coming here to the airborne. We do PT here, right? And blah, you know, and it's, yeah, again, yeah. it's, like, it's the whole thing. You know, it's all good, but you yeah. know, I've noticed like throughout my career as I uh you know was reflecting after you know retiring uh you know last month. Um I said, man, what, you know, how did I stumble to these things? And I think it's just the contrast. The look at the contrast in life uh, has helped me along the way, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Um, did you, what years were you over there in, in Germany? I was there, um, came in 96, uh, and I was in Germany 97 to 99. Okay. Was Bosnia or anything going on still at the time? Did you guys do any rotations over there at all, or? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. I think I was in the Air Force 14 months on my first deployment. So oh, yeah. came in September 96 and I was deployed to Bosnia like November, December 97. Wow. How'd that go? How was that? I was crazy. You know, I thought I was going to World War Three. you know, I've been <laughs> right. in the military for 14 months. You know? <laughs> and man, talk about a, you know, talk about a clown show. Um, I mean, yeah. Versburg and, you know, you think it's the, the, the big complex and you get dropped off at the door and people take care of you, you know. And I was like, hey, man, good luck with that. You see them right now. And all our equipment was big back then. As you remember, have yeah. a sleeping bag, you know, like this big around, you know, <laughs> yeah. like the bell of hay. Um, I had to hand carry my MVGs, my PVS fives in a separate case, you know, right. almost, almost like it to your wrist with the handcuffs. You know, don't lose that. Right, and right. My gear, I think I had like, I don't know, six, seven bags. And they took me to the train station in Würzburg. Here's this 19 year old kid taking the train to uh, Frankfurt on public, you know, German train with all this kit to try, oh to, get my to, God. to try to get over to Rhine mine to, you know, the lift. And man, it was a, it was a clown show. And, and when I did get to Bosnia, there was some strikes going on. 
And again, you know, all, all our OIF stuff, you know, nothing, right? It's peacekeeping mission. Sure. But for a 19 year old kid, man, it was the world, right? And yeah. There's nothing going on in the nineties since, you know, desert storm and, uh, you know, 93 and, uh, and, uh, Somalia, but, and I get there and there's no, no transportation from Tuzla, Maine to Camp Batrock, which is why I was supposed to be stationed. Mm-hmm. No one, to, uh, I think I met Dunny Hayes there, you know, that's the okay. first time I met Dunny Hayes, who's at the Isla Maine, uh, Eagle, Maine. And I was like, Hey man, I got to get to Bedrock. They're waiting for me like now, you know? So I hitched a ride with some MP unit was doing patrols, like man, get in the back of the you know, slanted Humvee, sit in the middle, I'm like this, no seat, you know. Jeez. I get to I get to bedrock, they drop me off at the front gate. Now I'm carrying all my stuff through the camp camp, like, hey, where's the Air Force guys? And man, talk about clown show. Yeah. I get there, Chuck Holbrook was my NCO I see. Oh, okay. Right? So so talk about another another leadership opportunity, right? Sure. Not a not a sexy airborne guy, you know. Dude knew closer support. Oh yeah. Dude knew leadership. And I would say, uh uh, I owe a lot of my leadership success, if you will, uh, from Chuck Holbrook. But anyway, he's like, uh, I said, hey, where's Gerardo Mercado? He's another guy. He's an armor guy. I knew him from Germany. He goes, oh, man, he's he's out doing missions with special ops. I'm like, really? Yeah, he got AC-130. I'm like, okay, where's so-and-so? Oh, man, he's out with the other special ops teams. They're doing, you know, some secret stuff. He's making all this stuff up. I'm, I'm believing him. Oh. You, know? <laughs> you know, it's Bosnia. It's cold. He goes, yeah. hey, you ready? I'm like, ready for what? He goes, hey, man, you got to go on patrol. You got air coming on. You got F-16s coming on in, in like an hour. Again, I've been in the Air Force 15 months. A lot of e tag romance. He goes, hey, here's this, here's this book. Here's the regulations and everything you need to know. It's just a big book. It's just thick. And he's like, all right. And I'm standing there and I'm reading. I'm like skimming, you know, trying to prepare. Right, right. And, and about, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes later, he goes, hey, man, you ready? Got any questions? I was like, yeah. He goes, what's that? I said, can I do I have time to get my winter boots? He's like, yeah, go get them on. I'll go put them on. I'll grab my stuff. He's like, man, I just want to check and see how you how you act under pressure, man. Uh, <laughs> Mercado's at the gym. Uh, Hazel Time is over at the chow hall, man. Let's see. Ain't shit going on. <laughs> but, but, you know. <laughs> You know, it's like, hey man, that sounds about right. That. that sounds about right. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, that's not too dis. That's not too different from what we have to do in OIL. You know, for sure, base. for sure. Yeah. yeah. Exact same thing, right? Figure that yeah. out. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. From then on, uh, you know, Chuck always had a looked out for me from then on. So yeah, I appreciate yeah, he's a good him. dude. Yeah, that was yeah, it was a real shame what happened to him. Um, but he's, yeah. yeah, he was one of the good ones, man. One of the good ones for sure. For sure. For sure. Hey, where were you at in Germany? I was at Vilsack. I was at Rose Barracks with, um, right. we went, uh, I went to Bosnia with one quarter cav, uh, like in 95, I want to say 94, 95, something like that. But they, okay. we didn't really do anything. It was the same with you. It was like peacekeeping and you would travel, you, you know, we did more of like, a. um, we would guard mass grave sites. You know, they were, they were excavating all those bodies and stuff. And we were just kind of like pull security for them in case of any Serbs came over to try to stop us from doing it. But there was no, it was nothing. I mean, nothing really ever came of it. So that's what the two, six, uh, armor for okay. first, first armor division. Okay. Yeah. But that's a good place for young eat, you know, run at all the cast we had. Right. You oh know? yeah. Man. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Man, cause we, we used really? to go, cause Vilsic was right close to Grafenbeer. So we would just, we'd go right over to Graf and there'd be like tornadoes that would just come over on the regular and you know, do all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Mirage. All yeah, those, yeah. Those things. That's and, a good point. Yeah. There was like so many different like uh foreign aircraft that would, you got to control over there. Yeah. It was awesome. But, and, and, you know, again, dating ourselves. So the sits cast integrated targeting system. Right. I forgot about that. Yeah. Right. Right. You know, like, yeah. Oh man, we got this new thing in our chest. Like, dude, we've been doing that since 95, you know, I know. it was this yeah, you big, had like you know, that. Like, what was it like that computer and then you had the radio and then you had like a, there was like three or four components to that thing or something, wasn't it? Or the PSN yeah. 11, the big bulky GPS. Oh, right, right, right. With the 800 cables that thick, you know, and you <laughs> right. connect to the, to the 113 and yeah, the yeah. tablet was that thick and this big, you know, and it had a big suitcase that went with it, you know, but we're right, right. doing data, you know? And, yeah, yeah. You yeah. had to like break it out. I mean, you had to like hook all these things together. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was kind of a mess. Yeah, you know, so, you know, this this doing that. And, you know, a lot of you guys remember just the nine line, the 11 line, and the 15 line. Mm, that's right. That's right. I forgot about yeah. that. 
Yeah, it was it was three it was three lines, and then we had Wix eighty four and European seventy nine. That's right. Europe was a different thing. I mean, like you said, it, there was so many different intricacies. You had to. It wasn't just the standard stuff. Like you had to learn all the other stuff too, like the NATO and yeah, it was interesting. I had, yeah. I had a good time over there. I, I had a blast. Yeah, I ain't, I ain't gonna talk about my off duty time, man. That was by the time I got <laughs> the fourth flag. Like I'm not partying anymore. I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm good for a lifetime. Yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about that. So Fort Bragg, I mean, that's like we uh, there's been a lot of guys on here that have gone through Bragg or had some interactions with Bragg. And it's 14th ASOS has always been traditionally like one of the you know premier units. You know, there's a lot of hard chargers there. A lot of a lot of soft guys come out of there. So, yeah, tell me about that. Tell me how, about that experience. Uh, oh, that was uh, great, man. As you know, your, your environment matters, right? Sure. And, and the 14th ASOS is a prime example. There's no way it's just coincidence that all of the great leaders we had in our career field and has also become great leaders uh, within the Air Force, they so happen to be at or go through or has some association with Fort Bragg. It's sure. not a coincidence. Right. Uh, the, the environment you operate within, you know, whether it's civilian life, you know, kids on the street, you know, no matter what color you are uh, uh, or demographic you are, your environment matters. Mm -hmm. And you know, the 14th Ace House is a prime example that for good or bad, you know, we had great leaders. Like when I was there, it was, uh, uh, Mark Villela, you know, and then Roger Cross and Marty Klukas. I'm like, dude, if you can't, if you can't thrive with those type of leaders, man, I, I don't, I don't know what to, what to tell you, you yeah, know? Yeah. yeah. We had you know, Drew Ford and, you know, all, all right. those guys, man. And then your peer group, you know, uh, you know, you, you try to be the best man, but for sure you don't want to be the last man. Right. Oh, so, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, and and, and I hate this term because it's overused, but iron sharpens iron. But you know, man, you know, guys were the hustle. I had my first set of roommates were uh, DT and Jeff Mariano. Okay, and so we call it we call it NATO, even though Mexico is not part of NATO. But we had a <laughs> we had an Italian, a Mexican, and a black guy living together. You know, right, and right. Then, yeah, I moved over from that, and then um, Avram Ruiz and Keith Griefer were, were my roommates. You know, and you know, Ivan Reese went over to become a pararescue and uh, PJ and, you know, earned the, the Air Force Cross, you know, Service Cross recipient, you know, all these great things. And, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, back we're in shape. And, and I was like, hey, man, if you eat three times a day, you got to work out three times a day. You know, so we go do VPT at 14th, the Imperial 14th day sauce. Mm -hmm. And when uh, for lunch, we do a run, swim, run. So we run a mile, swim a mile, run a mile. And then the three of us doing calisthenics at nighttime, you know, Nice, man, talking about being in some great shape. Don't ask me yeah. to do that now, but <laughs> you know, those are the good old days for sure. Now, yeah. but man, but 14 was great. Um, again, compare and contrast, right. Uh, and I was thinking about it, This just came up recently. I said, just retired. I was trying to reflect on my career, you know, lessons learned, you know, you want to bring something in, you know, through experience and, you know, we're talking about the 59, the 11 line and the nine line and European versus American, you know, compare and contrast. That's where, you know, learn some of the TTPs from. And then going from Armour to Fort Bragg, you know, compare and contrast, right? The the discernment is in the, the differences and the details. And I tell you, man, the 14th was awesome. Uh, had a great crew, crew of guys. Um, but yeah, man, a lot of my schools was there, you know, so now I've been in for two plus years, almost three years, but I'm behind my peer group. You know, I'm an A1C now. Uh, these guys have been there for three years jumping. I'm a five jump chump. But hey, man, I got some some ground to make up. So uh, in 24 months, in less than 24 months, uh, to include a rotation to Kuwait, I got 64, 65 jumps. Nice. I'm not talking about, you know, free fall halo when we're doing Hollywood. It's all nice. You know, it's on old school, static line, 82nd Airborne, Mass Tac, you know, the whole nine, right? And just yeah. to play catch up, you know. And, and from Fort Bragg, I got my my JM went to Jump Master School there at the 82nd Airborne Jump Master School. The Jump Master School, by the way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, went to uh, Air Assault, um, Pathfinder, you know, and met a, a great friend of mine, uh, Man, that's that's my you know my my brother from another mother, Eight Martins. You know, yeah, yeah. He's, he's another guy. Went to a lot of things. Well, he was the best man at my wedding. Oh no, kidding! Went, I didn't know that. Yeah, I yeah, went to JTAC UC together. Um, cool. Uh, you know, went out to Nellis. Went to do the Nellis course. Went to Air Assault School. 
uh, we both said, man, you know, I don't, I don't know about this type P thing, man. It's nothing going on, you know. He's like, man, let's just try it for a Ranger type P. Okay, so we did that together. Nice. We also said, hey, let's try it for Special Missions Union on the other side of Fort Bragg, you know, the, yeah, yeah. the one that Chuck Norris used to work for, you know. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and uh, so Abe made all the calls, and we did the first interview and PT test. They went to the second interview and PT test and assessment, we went to the third assessment. We went to the fourth assessment together. Okay. And he and I got our orders for the long walk. And so uh, we went to the commanders like, hey, uh, we're going to go to do the long walk in October. And we want to cross train to the Army. And we just had one, asked one th- thing for the Army, like, hey, can you put in writing, you know, if we don't make it through the training? And because the way it worked is when you leave the Air Force, you go through the long walk. At some point before you full up, Pledge member, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. you're vetted. You're not in the Air Force anymore. Right. You're in the Army. Right. Right. And so it's like, hey, can you put in there? At least if we don't make it, we become like 18 series or something, not like 11 bang bang. Because I don't want to go down to, you know, down yeah. to the, down to 80 deuce and start doing hut hut, you know, nothing wrong. Right. No, no, no offense to those guys, but I didn't want to do that. Right. It's not what you're looking for. Yeah. yeah. It's not, not what I'm looking for, man. Right. You know, and yeah. so it's a like, yeah, no problem. And then that summer. So we did that and I'm successful, had our orders in hand. I actually still got my orders probably somewhere in that shelf. You know, this is pretty cool. And um, uh, he went to Ranger School that summer and I went to Kuwait that summer. Okay. And uh, I work with uh, the conventional unit but because of all my assessments. I got to meet guys like Larry Patton yeah. and uh, Todd Gannon was over there, you know, uh, 14 guy, but I also met him over there and see uh, Terry, right. Terry Langley, non soft guy, but great leader, great cast guy. And this is right after Jason Faley uh, was killed. Okay. You know, at the Udari range, right? Yeah. And um, yeah, it's horrible. And actually uh, my rotation, we opened the range back up. Oh, okay. And uh, this little note, you know, help keep keep me on track because my brain goes all over the place, but um, we help open the range back up. I have a piece of uh, the Humvee that uh, Tim Cruising and Jason Faley were standing next to. Really? And I have a piece of bomb fragment from that incident. And this right here is bomb fragment from Jason Faley's fatality. I, I picked this up off the off the ground back in 2001, you know, I guess now 20, 21 years ago yeah. um, from, from the range. And so I always kept that with me, you know, for two decades, but to remind you about, you know, uh, whether it's training or not, what we do is real. But for sure. Um, so going going through that, and uh, I got back from Kuwait. I think September the, I don't know, seventh or something like that. Mm-hmm. September eleventh. And so you know, I'm there at Fort Bragg, and at some point the commander said, "Hey, I know you guys are going to do the the long walk in in October, but." Uh, do you want to be part of the second wave of guys going to Afghanistan? I'm like, yep. I don't know where Afghanistan is at, but yeah, I want to go. Right. And so <laughs> back to A. Martins, uh, A. Martins and I, we both went to Afghanistan together in 2001. I think it was late October, November, I think November, 2001, we went over to Afghanistan. Okay. So, so Abe and I, we go way back as well. Yeah. Yeah. He's a great dude. So tell me about that. Tell me about that deployment. How was that first deployment for you? I mean, I know a lot of guys have different experiences on that initial push or what, whatever your initial push was to, you know, after the towers came down, I mean, it was kind of, we were all, there was like a real visceral kind of a rage that we all had. I mean, tell me, so tell me about your, your initial deployment over there. Yeah. You know, I would talk about a lot of guys talk, talk noise until it's time to, to that, right. I want to do this and I want to do that, you know, and, you know, we used to sing those Jodies, anybody, somebody start a war. Right, and so right. I was excited. You know, you don't want to practice football and not to get to play in a football game. Sure. Right. And so now it's now it's go time. Uh, I think for me, uh, expectations were set by my uh, now father-in-law and my uncle. So my uncle, he was a Vietnam vet, uh, quarter cav. Mortarman, Purple Heart recipient, uh, very familiar with close air support, call a lot of cast as a army person oh, and nice. come back to tours. And then also my father-in-law, you know, and it, they respect me being in the military and, you know, what I did is attack P, but it was still a wall there. Both those individuals, Vietnam vets, my father-in-law, Quezon Marine, if you're familiar with Quezon, you know, yeah, for sure. you know 5,000 wow. Marines surrounded by, you know, almost 20,000, you know, North Vietnamese army. 
that yeah, he was yeah. there, right? So he understands wow. close support too, right? Yeah. And so when I got the the go, the green light to go to Afghanistan, you know, they both independently of the, each other, you know, called to, to have a sit down, talk with me about, about combat expectations management. And, hey, this is the real deal. So now I've earned uh, the right to listen to them, for them to open up and share. And, you know, they share with a, a whole host of things, but, you know, I'll, I'll share maybe two things. Uh, you know, my uncle told me, he goes, you know, the things that keep you up at night and, and causes nightmares and causes you to lose your mind. It's not the things that you have to do, but the things that you didn't have to, but you chose to anyway. Right? That's not in textbook. No, yeah. you know, that's, that's, that's experience, you know? Yeah. And, you know, my father-in-law talk about the clarity of mind, you know, don't, don't be upset. If you're upset, either happy that you're, you know, taken to the enemy or you, you're, you're in fear for your life, whatever the case may be, whatever emotion that clouds your judgment and your clarity of mind. And I, I always kept that with me. And so I tried to be as clinical as I could the whole time to, and I found that it did help, um, uh, you know, later on as, as you know, you and I, we kept going on rotations, rotations, rotations. Sure, sure. And a testament to that too, you know, I thought I had clarity of mind, but you know, in the back of your mind, you always worry about, you know, it's just going to be my time to, you know, to, to get shot or to right. get fragged or catch a, uh, you know, a roadside bomb or whatever. And I remember uh, one deployment, I can't tell you when, but I remember when it clicked, when it's like, you know what, if I'm dead, I'm dead. People say that, but when you internalize it, it's two different things. Sure. And I remember when I, when it clicked where I really truly didn't care. I said it many times before yeah. when it really clicked. Wow. Talk about clarity of mind. I was so much sharper on the X. For sure. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. So, so, so yeah, I was like, yeah, th those dudes was right. But I thought I was good. But when I, when it clicked with him, so, you know, make a long story short as far as what you asked me. Uh, but that was my, that's my first experience. It wasn't actually going there as the prep, you know, from, from veterans, right. Yeah. Real you know, combat veterans happened to be my uncle and father-in-law. Um, but so when we got there, Man, compare and contrast, right? We had the 113, we had the plugger, you know, we had oh, all right. these things. And then you get in country, here, here's the 117, never seen it before. Yeah. Here's a Garmin GPS from whatever sports store, you know, here's right. a Mark 7. So the things that do your job, how you communicate, how you target, and how you find out where you're at and, and you know, find, fix the enemy. Yeah, Those three things, the primary job, new equipment in country. Figure that shit out. Yeah, that's ne that's not usually good. Yeah, you, yeah. Want to, yeah, you want to know that stuff before you get there for sure. Yeah. yeah. So and so you know I tie that back into Bosnia. You know, like hey man, you know, if you wait till last minute, you only got a minute, right? So right. this time right. I didn't wait. Hey, whatever time I got is what I got. And you figure this shit out, you know. So uh, me and uh, eight Martins, you know, we fly in on C one uh, C seventeen. There's only two of us there. Uh, C seventeen land. Uh, some forklift takes some cargo off, uh, and they drive off in the darkness. He and I get out with all our bags. C seventeen button up taxis and fly away. Now we in Uzbekistan at whatever clock in the morning. It's pitch black dark. There's no terminal, nothing. It's just you know it's an old you, nobody, nobody here to pick you up. <laughs> no, not at all. Oh my god! Oh, like dude, like what is going on? You know, like <laughs> you know, like, I, I, so technically this is my third deployment in two thousand one. You know, I did Bosnia, Kuwait, but first combat deployment. Sure. And we're walking all our kit. We go to a little bitty house. And I mean, like a one bedroom shack type house, you know, sitting way off in the corner. Kind of saw a silhouette, you know, and they had any lights on. It's just like a silhouette that was less dark than the darkness of the sky. Sure. And uh, we go over there, we open up the door that's in the middle. And this one dude sitting in a, in a chair in the middle of the room with this old, poorly lit, dim light, you know, and he speaks no English and we speak no use back. And trying to figure out what's going on. And it was just like, what, what is going on here? It's like a bad movie. Yeah. You know, we hear some quads and some ATVs, you know, coming up and we go outside and finally here's the, here's the SL teams with some, with some vehicles come pick us up, you know? So that's a, me and Abe's experience, but it was a good 30 minutes. Like, you know, trying to figure out what, what you know, WFO, you know, what, what the hell. Yeah. If I had, I mean, I, you'd be surprised how many people have that same exact story. Like they're like, all right, get on this plane uh go into this far off land and just get off the plane and then just figure it out you know and then you know you don't really have any guidance and it's it's so weird how but that's the way it was though i mean the, it was so it was all kind of new to everybody because i mean we like you said we haven't been in war since desert storm so you know we we're all just trying to figure it out so yeah. so they picked you up and then 
Uh, now, so you were, did you guys support the SF guys when you were there or did they just take you over somewhere else or how'd that work? Yeah. So also I was aligned with, uh, ODA fifth group and I was ultimately assigned to ODA 542. So oh, nice. Yeah. So I went to ISOFAC, uh, went there, uh, they said, Hey, you're on this team. And there was sorry tech piece there, you know, before I got there. So, you know, Tim Stamey, um, oh, yeah. uh, Steve Tolmont, you know, all those, all those dudes, right. You know, those names. Guys Northern been, Alliance actually, legends, yeah. yeah. yeah exactly, exactly. Yeah. So those guys been in country already. I think Buddy Mac, uh, okay. Max Morris, you know, those dudes, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know. And so, they, you know, they've been an ISO fact for a while. And so I was assigned to a team, and I said the lottery, that team's ready to go. And then I forget who it was. I got bumped. Like, hey, bro, I've been here a couple of weeks, man. You just got here a couple of days ago. I'm taking your team. Like, <laughs> hey, fair enough, man. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, yeah. what are you going to do? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm still trying to figure out the radio, man. So yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> so <laughs> and so, I ultimately, I went to ODA five four two. I got there to say, "Here's your team," and they're like, "Man, who the f are you?" I'm like, "Hey, I'm your E type." Like, I don't even know E type Air Force dude. And team started like, "Man, I've been calling airstrikes long. You've been in Air Force. Get out of my tent." Really? I'm like, hey, you know that may be true, but I'm not leaving the tent, man. I'm I'm your E type. I'm signed to you, so. I can stand here. You show me a cot, man. You know, again, I'm, dude, I'm 23 years old, I think. Yeah, yeah. You know, we're young, man. You know, yeah. I had stop sergeant on. Made stop sergeant first time testing. So, not not to brag, but what I'm trying to say is I had stop sergeant on for like five months. Right. And it wasn't like you know it's my eighth time testing. I was brand new. Still like five years. Right. You're still young. Still a new guy. Kind of essentially. Yeah. Uh, right. And you know, we got these dudes. You know, you know, 18 years deep in SF. You got this kid showing up. Hey, I'm your, you know, hey, I'm from the government. I'm here to help, you know, I mean, get, get out of right? You know, <laughs> let's <scram. laughs> So, so I get there. Uh, one of the team guys, like, hey, man, sit your stuff over there. I set my stuff down, man. I didn't talk to him. I pull out my 117, start trying to figure it out, pull out my, and start working on my kit and trying to figure it out. And, you know, I guess look looked at me like, hey, man, this guy, it's all about business, man. He's like trying to take care of his crap, you know, and, you know, by the end of the day, man, they're all good. I'm like, hey, man, let's show you around, you know, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, you got, you got to prove who you are sometime. But, but again, yeah. the, the contrast, right? You know, we – two contrast points, again, the, the, for the theme is, you know, we had a 117 analog, if you will, radio to the – I'm sorry, 113 analog radio to the 117. Right. PSN 11 to the plug, you know, to the to the uh, Garmin. You know, this is – Yeah, and they, they don't – they're not even – they don't really even resemble each other. I mean, frankly, I mean, like the 117 was like a, a, it's so much more intricate, and there's so many more capability. Yeah, I, I can't imagine yeah, what you're going through. Crazy, right? you're thinking, yeah. <laughs> and then you know, this the old school, new school. You know, guys probably said on the other podcast. You know, it's like, hey, you know, we got you know, career war. Uh, you know, B B 52s dropping the latest and greatest J down, right? Mm -hmm. Right, we right. Got the latest and greatest satellite radios that just came out on our back, and we're on horseback. Right, exactly. You, you know what I mean? You yeah. know, we're, we're, we're linked to satellites fighting fighting guys in the mountains on foot. Yeah. Right. So that that, con that contrast again, you know, the the details of that and and just understanding your 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 skill set, understanding your people. Uh, so man, I had the best cross training there. You know, I uh, got to really uh, isolate with the team, and we had uh, cross training. So for three days, we did medical live tissue training from. Nice tricks to needle de uh, chest decompressions to from other artery on, you know, on authorized animals, you know, then we did comm training, you know, I, I led the close air support training. We did sniper training. We did, you know, uh, explosives and charges, you know, so man, talk about a brand new air force one Charlie four, you know, learn a lot. It was, it was, it was great again. Yeah. How lucky training. man to get all that, uh, get exposure to all that stuff. Mm -hmm. It was fun. So yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> And, and, you know, just to summarize, well, we did the, uh, Mo did, did the first uh, overland infill into Afghanistan. Uh, came out, did a proof of concept with that, met up with some special mission units from the British uh, government and leave it at that. And then uh, yeah, yeah. came back to Uzbek. And then uh, we were, I think, I think the first Americans into Orgun E. Oh, okay. Yeah, definitely first team to settle there. And so, again, right out of a, um, uh, a story go down to Bagram refit and we were on, I think, Pavlos and uh, we had the Toyota pickup trucks from, you know, Toyota of Nashville. Right, right. 
And, uh, you know, I pimped out, you know, told the trucks with all the modifications and yeah. two o'clock in the morning. And uh, I talked to the team sergeant. I said, like, team sergeant, like, dude, you have to let me ride this four wheeler off the back of this helicopter. Like, <laughs> I would never get the chance to do this again. You know, so right. here we are in the middle of nowhere, you know, coming in through the mountains at pitch black dark. I got B1, uh, B1s overhead, you know, circling on comms. Helicopters going and they're looking at the you know, DZ, make sure things clear. These helos come in, land, and here comes, you know, off the back of the, the quad, you know, with my radio on my back. And yeah. Like, yeah, man, I thought it was the cast me out, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, uh, and we get off the helicopter and, you know, ready for some action, you know, for the Taliban to come out and sure. you, know, you, fly, you know, helicopters leave and it's like pitch black dark. And, you know, we met with some, some OGA people, went to our safe house and that was it. <laughs> 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 I hate so that cool. so much when it's like you're ready to rock and then it's just nothing. It's just uneventful. You're like, all right, let's just go to bed. And then, uh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's time to go to sleep. Please. Oregon E had to be pretty austere at that time. I mean, I can't imagine it being built up at all at that time. No, the uh, Oregon E people don't know what's not. It was a, what's to some dude's house? I'm like, hey, uh, you know, be someone coming to us. I'm like, hey, man, your house is worth, I don't know, half a million dollars. I give you uh, 10 mil for it. You're like, so like i don't need to go through the house i mean maybe get some pictures maybe get my family but <laughs> <laughs> everything else you can he keep, just puts so. his hat on and just rolls out he's like i'm out of here. <laughs> exactly <laughs> so so equivalently like hey man here's here's some money for your house and guys yeah. like grab his family like they're they're gone right they're they're set so uh orguni was not orguni orguni was a was a house right. i had a, a large uh uh walled in yard that's yeah. that's where that's where ODA five four two set up, and so uh, you know we we were the um, the catalyst for creating a G force, right? So contrast, you know, my Ranger days, then at two seven five Alpha Company, and then later uh, BRD, you know, because your RD guys got reassigned to some do some cooler cooler stuff. Right, and so right. battalions had to pick up and stand up the own reconnaissance. Mm -hmm. I was the uh, BRD re Battalion Reconnaissance Detachment, uh, right. Jake uh, ETAC at the time. But contrast that to Afghanistan, you know, ODA team, where now we are creating and building a G force, yep. guerrilla force, and all the things that go within that, you know. So it's not just to jump off, kick in the doors, bang, bang, pull the trigger. Now you're looking at the the thought process, how you shape, I ain't saying hearts and minds, but how you shape thought. How do you manage a force to do something? How, how do you procure that? Right. And, and and I think that later on helped me as a leader as well, you know, looking at how that process works and, you know, how you do those things that takes time. There's no instant gratification or a um, guarantee outcome of success. Sure. Yeah. Based you don't know what you're getting. I mean, you could, who knows who these guys are that are even volunteering or they're, they're, they're recruiting. I mean, yeah, it's yeah. a crapshoot. Yeah. And, and and to uh at the risk of not losing my security clearance which i still have is you know <laughs> uh but some of the the people we're working with and and the people we're paying in country to to work with us and you know seeing all that real time right and and yeah. understanding man talking about what i guess i was 23 maybe 22 to see that man talk about you know formative it's a lot of new stuff yeah a lot of new things a lot of high level things that you probably didn't imagine you would even probably didn't uh, it's same way with me. Like when I first got exposed to it, it was like, I didn't even know it existed. You know, the stuff like that was like, what is this? What, who are these guys? And yeah, it's a, yeah. it's an, yeah, it's an amazing experience for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And a lot of people, you know, I don't say a lot of people, uh, but some people don't know that, you know, Anaconda was not originally called Anaconda. It was task force hammer and anvil. Okay. And it was supposed to happen in uh, January, not, March. Uh, okay. Yeah. So we had three ODAs, one in Orguni, one in Kaos, and one in uh, Gardez. Okay. And those ODAs jobs, one of them mine Orguni was to build, establish the guerrilla force, set the conditions, take those guerrilla force to help shape. And then the other soft elements that came along with the conventional elements, uh, they were to uh, do what they did. Okay. And Task Force Hammer and Anvil was us setting conditions in around the, you know, the the valley and where everything took place. And the hammer was the force that came in to root out the Taliban, 
my ODA in the Naka Valley was the Anvil. Oh, okay. We get the if you look at the demographic, they're supposed to funnel down into this valley, sure. and then open up to the Naka Valley, which is a greater opening. And yeah, me yeah. and ODA was on the backstop on the ridge line, and we we're the hammer. So when you guys came in to crush, we we're going to be the Anvil for the backstop, and we we're going to crush it together. Oh, okay. Yeah, and right. and because of the three letter agencies we're working with and how we were having security. Again, we, we put like, we purchased security from other people who are not us. Right. Sure. Um, uh, one of the teams had a hit put out on them. Really? Yeah. So, which was common. All of, all of us work with the same type individuals, different individuals, yeah. different individuals, same MO and they rule the area, you know, cause the, the, the Afghan government stops outside of Kabul. Yeah, Everything yeah. else is owned by other people, right? For sure, so for sure. We were tagged with other people. And okay. the other person with the other ODA is like, hey, um, one SF guy got shot in the chest, one got shot in the leg, guy got shot in the leg, bled out, died. Um, had a similar incident with our guys for us going back and forth where they disappeared, came back, you know. So very uh, shaky ground, you know, you're trying to do a combat yeah. house, but you're not sure if your friends are really friends, right? Oh, yeah. So that's why... Task Force Hammer and Anvil got pushed to the right uh, to no, to March. Oh, okay. Because we're trying to say, do we have the conditions that we need to have to like, pull this off? No doubt. I mean, you could have been walking into a, a huge ambush. I mean, they could have been just setting you up for, yeah, man. Yeah. So it's probably better off you guys held off. Right. But yeah. but it's not even walking to it. We, we eat and slept with them. So, you know, it was 12-man ODA with uh, some OJ people and the People forced that we lived with, we lived with these people. Mm -hmm. They were hundred strong, easy. Yeah. So we had and one you never our, know. Like uh, it's just tricky because you never know. Like it, it could just take one or two of those guys to not be uh, with you. You know, they could be, you know, just a plant or some sort of, you know, traitor or something. So yeah. Or it could be the the lead uh, the lead um, mafia boss, if you will. Uh, it's like, hey, I don't care about loyalty, I care about money, right? So sure. it's yeah. happening up north, right? So Oh, for sure. Yeah. So he he's the warlord. He he runs everything. So right. he can he can say like this and all one hundred people turn. Yep. yep. Right. So uh long long of a short, uh that that uh, warlord who authorized the hit, you know, we played alone, but he disappeared later on, right? After okay. <laughs> after Anaconda, right? But those were the conditions. The point is those are the conditions we operate in, you know. Yeah. Sure. Wasn't that a fob, you know, uh um it wasn't just on the X to come back, you know, we were living with the G force, right? And understand yeah, yeah. that, that cycle, that mental picture of, you know, who's your friend, who's your foe. And then oh, man, it had to be, you guys had, to, did you guys, so just a quick, just for my own edification, did you guys have like your own internal security? Like, did you got, were you guys like, okay, you, half of us will be up at all times or we'll at least put you pulling guard duty or something or like, I'd be nerve wracking to, to not know, you know, if you could trust the guys that are with you, especially in that, like, especially that early in the war, you know, like it right. seemed who knows who's who at that point, you know, so that right. had to be like, a little, we, all stayed a little the same room. we all stayed in the same room and we had a, one American up all at, at all times, you know, radio. Say, yeah. radio's always up. And, you know, uh, actually one night, you know, after the other ODA, they got ambushed, you know, very similar thing happened. The warlord and all his men, they left, just disappeared. Wow. And then things happen. So yeah, you know, yeah. there's a uh, disagreement on our on our side a week or two later, and uh, I'm sleeping and wanted to get the guys like Zach, get up, man, get up. I'm like what's up, what's up, man? We need aircraft right now. So I'm gonna get on the horn, you know. As I'm requesting cast, I'm asking why, you know. Right. Execute first, ask why later. Yeah. Uh, and oh, by the way, you know there was no 1972 and talk to the ASOC, right? There was no ASOC. There was no. I've requested uh, close air support uh, assets like probably five, six different ways, you know. Yeah. Whatever British or U.S. thing was flying overhead or whatever through the B team, through the SF, through, I mean, it was the wild, wild west. There was sure. very limited infra infrastructure, if anything. Yeah. But anyway, like what's going on? It's like, hey, man, the warlord who slept in the same compound with us. When I say compound, it's not a very, it's a house. Sure. With the wall in, so it's not a big place. He's right. gone out of his, his room. And the 60 dudes yeah. that stay here the whole time and in and around the area, they're gone. It's too close. Oh, my God. Oh, man. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so the whole team's up, man. We're on the rooftop, you know. Uh, make a long story 
shorter at B1s overhead, did some show force, you know, at mock whatever. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Sonic Boom rattled the town a couple of times, you know. So, hey, man, you – and actually we had agreement, you know, I'll talk to the teams like, hey, man, like how far are we going? And the team and the, and the OGA guys are like, hey, man, we're not going to be strung up and all this other bullshit. Like, you know, we're going to go out blaze of glory. So, like, all right. And so I talked to the aircraft. I said, hey, man, all of us here on the grants, when it comes to it, you will drop inside the compound like everything you got. So we get to the point where we're hand-to-hand – level this place i mean yeah. and it's that real you know so at 20 what 22 years old like dude like all right man this is this is how we roll man. so uh yeah and it's funny too uh um i forget the guy's name man he happened to his team happened to come through at the same time so we had two jtacs and our team oh, started yeah. like all right we want one jtac on this part of the uh the the roof we want one jtac on this part of the roof We're like dude it's not a 240 man it's not a- <laughs> right <laughs> It's not second or fire position. We were better for breaking together, right? Yeah, yeah. I got to know what he's doing so I don't do the same thing or step on him or what. Yeah, we compliment each other. No, no. Like, damn, he's our team sorry. Like, damn, bro. I know you're old school team sorry, man, but let us you don't know close air compartment. It's not yeah, a yeah. Before, it's not a Mark 19, man, where you need to spread us right. out. Hey, sectors of fire and stuff. Yeah. But, um. Uh, man, this so whatever short. happened, like, what was the deal? Why'd they bug out like that? Like, what were they uh, doing? Yeah, conflict of, uh, not get too much details, but weren't happy about what was going on. Oh, and, okay. you know, maybe conversations and stuff like that. And, and maybe some other interest, um, came back the next day along with people in the town, Orguni, they knew the Americans was in this building right outside of town. What a line of, I don't know, 75 people. And they're there to bring us whatever they thought they shouldn't have had. You know, so I ran B1s at Mach whatever, Sonic, you know, boom, at 2 o'clock in the morning. I mean, I know they're coming, and it's still, <laughs> yeah. you, you feel like, oh, man, you oh, know. Yeah. So, you know, they woke up in the night, oh, hey, man, this this rifle that I had, I probably shouldn't have this, or <laughs> whatever, this mortar, oh, I got three grenades, you know. So guys were like, it's like, uh, you know, coming to. Uh, you scared you the know, contraband out of them. Yeah. <laughs> like coming to church, man, and, you know, like, hey, I want to repent. And so <laughs> we had a lot of people were like, I don't know what this is, but maybe I shouldn't have it. I want to give it to you. Make sure that you don't, you know, make me disappear. So <laughs> right, I, right. Well, it's all good. Man. It's just, so it's like a lot of, you know, lessons learned, you know. Sure. It's just, wow. But, yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> man, I remember, um, you know, Task Force Hammer and Anvil that became Anaconda. You know, we're looking at the plan with the OJ guys. And I was like, man, like. Dude, this is complicated. And I'm still a young guy. And he's like, yeah. man, this plan was built by professionals. I was like, yeah, so was the Titanic. But Noah's art was pretty simple and, and it worked. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and and I'm not laughing that, you know, our plan went the way it did, but and it kind of went the way it did, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. I was like, dude, yeah. this is a complicated plan, you know. And then everyone's too too cool for school. But, you know, just to I want to say wrap up Afghanistan, but you know, not to uh, make this podcast a four hour podcast that no one listened <laughs> to, but um, you know, we finally got in place and you know, you see who's who in the zoo when, when certain things happen. Um, we've moved into another position and, you know, watching, watching our guys do work on the ridge line, you know, uh, from, from the day to the night, to the middle of the night, to the next morning, you know, and I'm on the, yeah. I have front row tickets, man. I didn't drop anything during Anaconda because uh, obviously the plan didn't work and they didn't funnel through to my valley. But, man, I'm watching, you know, B-52s dropping what I call tit tacks. You know, you see them glistening off the, the sun and I'm like, dude, oh, yeah. someone's getting jacked up. And into the night where the ridge line silhouette is highlighted because of the explosions on the back end, right? You know, like, man, you know, guys putting in work and hearing one side it comes from the aircraft, but I couldn't hear the JTAC, you know, our Type B comes. You know, right. the weirdest line. Just, just seeing that, and um, from you know, they call me the goat, not the greatest of all times, but actually like a the animal goat. <laughs> sure. Um, <laughs> so we're doing our special reconnaissance, and you know, we're climbing these mountain tops. Base camp is like 8,800, 8,500. We're climbing to 10 to 10 8 to you know, freezing our ass off. Yeah. And so, two SF guys and me will go up and we get compromised. What you gotta do? Calm down, find another peak. Well. Yeah, yeah. The next peak is not the same two SF guys, two freshmen. 
Hey, you're oh, yeah, yeah. But hey, who's going again? Right. So, you know, after the third or fourth summer, like, dude, man, you're you're a goat. And like, good thing I'm in shape, you know. But uh and I, That's I will lot, yeah. That, somebody I was just talking to somebody else about that. Like the life of JTEC is like you you don't have the luxury of sitting out a mission, you know, like they can rotate in and out, but you you're the only guy there that has that kind of that power, that that uh capability. So yeah, you gotta go. And you know, the yeah. Rangers was jealous, you know, you do platoon, platoon plus hit. Yeah. And so, you know, you got guys who are missing out, you know, every third or fourth mission they get to go on. But, you know, we get to go on every mission. And, you know, guys right. are jealous. Like, Damn, man, you get to go on everything. Like, yeah, yeah. it's good good and bad. I, 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 yeah, I, was, yeah. I, I would say this, you know, uh, talk about discernment. So uh, one of the people who found out who was in Iraq later, uh, I was tasked to do SR and say, hey, he's going to be at this location within your valley. Uh, once the things line up, you clear it to call airstrike. And so for three days, we did pattern in our life, you know, so I'm at 10,600 feet looking at this, see the kids uh, watching or playing, playing games, about, about 12, 15 kids. You see the women, probably about four or five of them, you know, doing their washing, the daily chores, all that, you know, for about three or four days. And finally, the vehicles that they said was going to come with, with the number of fighting age men, um, well, the, all, everything matched. Like, this is the dude, right? So yeah. I got aircraft overhead, and they're looking at the target, and it's like, hey, man. I asked the ground commander. I said, dude, like, this is what's going on. He goes, Zach, it's your call. And the reason why I stopped to tell the story, I thought about my my uncle, right? Mm-hmm. So it's not the things you have to do, the things that you had the opportunity not to. Sure. And so I was asking, hey, you know, you know, is this guy worth the lives of those other people? And I can't definitely say Yes. All right. So this guy go, I didn't drop, uh, even though the nice. aircraft gun, Hey, let's go. Let's go. Oh, of course called they were. The, yeah. Yeah. I called the mission off. I didn't drop, you know? So some people might say, Oh man, you're, you're weak, whatever. Mm, don't think so. But, uh, you know, this guy, I, I don't think so. No, I mean, that's, that's your job as a JTAC to, to make that discernment, to make, to, to limit, limit collateral damage. I mean, we can't just go out there and just wholesale kill, you know, civilian, you know, have civilian casualties like that. I think you made it. Uh, that's a perfectly fine decision for sure. Yeah. Right. I mean, right. Well, you know how it is in the beginning of the war, man. It's the first war we had since forever. So guys trying to get their bona fides, right? You sure. Know, sure. Um, and uh, you know, which even speaks more more highly of you to make that decision because you weren't like, well, this could be my time to get my, you know, I may never get a chance to drop again. Yeah. And you didn't take it, and you you made the right decision. I mean, that's that's commendable, man. I think. I appreciate that, man. Yeah. But yeah, man, I could talk on forever that first uh, Afghan uh, uh, deployment, man. A lot of lessons learned, but yeah, again, it's the compare and contrast, man. You know how how things work, and you know, uh, you know, we had our dark soft and light soft, you know, black so- black ops and white ops, right? And we're sure, not sure. talking. We're trying to call airstrikes on each other. You know, later right. we get a deep brief. There's like, hey, man, uh, this is one team trying to call airstrike. But hey, we got this blocking position. These guys with beers and machine guns and, you know, somebody trying to call it airstrike. It was, it was our ODA, right? You know, no one's talking. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. No one caught it. So, likely we didn't uh, we didn't get dropped on. Yeah, that was a very – that was a touchy subject or situation in the very beginning because there was, like, like you said, the comm wasn't there. and There were just people everywhere just doing everything, and it was kind of a little loose. But, yeah, we're lucky we didn't suffer some more fratricide than we did for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So that's really awesome that you got to go to an ODA out of the 82nd, not not just another, you know, not just with an 82nd unit. Not that that would have been a bad thing, but like it's pretty cool that you got to, you know, that they needed that many. Because I mean, we talked about this before too. Like, the there are so many ODAs out there that didn't have ETACs at the time, and like it was, Tech P's really got a great opportunity to kind of fill those empty positions. I thought that was really awesome. Yeah, luck and Tommy, man. Uh, again, going contrast, go from. Armor, you know, infantry, mechanized infantry, first right. ASOS, uh, first infantry division, second ASOS to, you know, airborne to now soft, you know, ODA yeah. invasion 2001, and then get back, you know, I turned down my lone walk orders to special mission unit in Fort Bragg. And right. then it's, hey, do you want to go over here to the, to the uh, SF teams here at Bragg? But you remember you tried out for Ranger Type B and you can go there too. Like, I'm going to try something different. So then I PCS'd. Uh, in 2002, after getting back from uh, uh, Afghanistan invasion, and uh, PCS to Fort Lewis to okay. two uh, second range. Yep. And so, and then in 2003, you know, Iraq happens, and I was fortunate enough to evade Iraq with Alpha Company, second range battalion. You know, okay, 
Yeah, I'll, I'll save that. I'll save that story for another podcast, man. Because yeah, we'll, we'll be talking for another another hour and a half on that one. Okay. All right. <laughs> is it a long one? Is that why you don't want to? It's long, man. It's, you know, a lot of lessons learned. I just want to do a survey. If we if we have time another time, do it. You know, do it sure. justice about the lessons learned versus glossing over it. But you know, okay. um, yeah, you know, going in two seven five and. Uh, we thought we had Saddam in one location before we had ground forces, you know, deep in and was able to, you know, call air strikes with some A-10s and on a special public guard and, you know, go into the city. And, you know, we're going to do a highlight for doing a highlight teaser trailer for next time. But you <laughs> right, know, right. Hey, remember, we're all together at a certain location and we're going to jump into Saddam International until we find out that, you know, three of the 10 C-17s were going to be shot down before green light. Like, hmm. Um, I want a mustard stain, but not that bad, right? Yeah, but, right, right. It's like who's gonna get, who's gonna get shot down? Yeah, is it that yeah. important? Right. And so you know, and then you know, we all went there to Saddam International, and then we started running our ops out of there. So, uh, uh, but yeah, we we save that story for another time. Okay, all right. <laughs> so then, uh, so you were two seven five. So what if you since we're skipping over two seven five? How I mean, do you have anything else you want to talk about as far as like when you went to the Rangers, uh, um, that experience there? Like what? How did that? shape you on to go to other things you know like everything your- from from a tactician to a leader uh you know i was there from 02 to 08 07 08 at 275 okay. so you know invaded iraq 2003 the next year I went back to afghanistan uh i was with pat tillman when he was killed you know arizona oh, Carter, okay right player he was alpha company uh wow. so you know we did it I served with him for almost two years before he was killed. No in kidding. April, in April, yeah. Um, I was seeing a picture he and I uh, doing the invasion of Iraq. Yeah. That in two thousand three, uh, but I was with him that morning. You know when things happened. You know it was on the on the border of uh, Pak and Afghan, and you know some things going down. Again, I'll say that those stories for the Ranger days because a lot of them. But uh, I was joking with him. Say, hey man, it should have been an ETAC. You can fly back on a helicopter and get ready for the next mission, not the drive back, you know? <laughs> and uh, so I was with, uh, I think it was second platoon. We flew back to refit. And I think first platoon had the drive back. And uh, it's one private lane, man. And he was like, man, Chief Zach, I mean, Sergeant Zach, I'm going to quit the Army. I said, why is that? It sucks. I'm like, hey man, you know, no one's shooting at us, you know, you, you good to go. We got a hot child. We, we're all right, you know? <laughs> and. <laughs> That morning I said that and I was messing with Pat. And then, you know, a few hours later, you know, we got a call that, you know, everything was going on. I flew back out uh, to the site. Everything was over when I got there. Um, yeah. But I was with the platoon sergeant, uh, Sergeant Godick. He and I were picking up, you know, pieces of Pat from the ground, putting in plastic zippies to make sure we, and, you know, uh, private lane, we brought him up. He took two rounds to the chest. Luckily he had his vest on. Yeah, yeah. Going around to the leg, you know, he's medevaced. Uh, Lieutenant Utlau, uh, who was a PL, um, great, great young lieutenant. Uh, he caught around and went through the back of his, uh, from right to left lat, underneath the body armor, but did not pierce his chest cavity. Talk oh, about, thank God. Talk about lucky, you know, but. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. Just a flesh room, right? I mean, I stopped my toe. I'm about to pass out, but you know, I have a flesh room go through and through. Uh, yeah, we call like, we're calling him lucky, but yeah, <laughs> he probably didn't feel very lucky. <laughs> yeah, and 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 ate an AK-47 round. He took a AK-47 round in the mouth, knocked his teeth out, went through his lips, but it what? went this way, right? Holy crap! Right. So, um, so again, like Rangers, another time. Uh, but yeah, uh, went back to Afghanistan. Uh, with the Rangers again, uh, then in 05, went to Iraq with the Rangers. Uh, that special missions unit that I tried out for years ago, yeah, yeah. Uh, they needed a ETAC because of the casualty rate. And so I became the eighth guy on the eight-man uh, D-boy team Okay. in Mosul. Talk about phenomenal. Oh, man, Mosul, too. Gee whiz, how'd that go? Another story. Awesome, dude. <laughs> Yeah, eighth guy on 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 that particular force, our, our authorities and the level of people looking at and man, yeah, yeah. wow, eye opening, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, he's he's on TV now, so I'm not out on him. But my my sergeant major was Cal Lamb, so a lot of people know Cal Lamb, Viking Tactical. Okay. Yeah, uh, you know, Viking Tactical, big company. He's on the History Channel. 
that was my sergeant major. Um, oh, no kidding. Yeah. So uh, you look him up. And so, man, again, man, very blessed, very fortunate, right time, right place, just sure. to stumble into things, you know, and, and to, to, to be able to experience them. But yeah, yeah. No kidding. Yeah. So how many total uh, deployments did you do at 275? Only five. Only five. Yeah. Only five, five ranger deployments is pretty good. I mean, that's uh, that's nothing to sneeze at there. I'm telling you. No, you know, we got a guys, you know, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. For sure. Yeah, no, of course. Yeah, there's these guys would have a ton more. But just just knowing what I know about a deployment, I mean, it, they're challenging enough. So, yeah, I mean, it's. And during the time we're doing them, you know, not the, the diminishing any part of the war, but, you know, everything's. No, new. no, no initial evasions of these places and trying to figure things out and yeah especially iraq i mean that was that was even weirder than afghanistan almost because they were like things are changing so quickly and you know there was a lot is really loose over there in the beginning but yeah so and, you know and going back and forth you know and and how right. we outfit as a you know range battalion in iraq and afghanistan was completely different yeah. and the reason why i cut short you know air force calls say hey man uh you need to go to korea i'm like why would i want to leave <laughs> well, the premier Tac P units, right? Go do ASOC duty in Korea and be away from my family, oh, by the way. But yeah, yeah, that's, that's what cut it short. So in 07, I PCS and I went to uh, Osan, Korea, uh, working for Shroka, uh, okay. Second Republic Korean Army. And because of this soft background, that's why they assigned me there, not the Troka, which most guys go to, you know, up north. Sure. So Troka was supposed to be the counter soft team. So they, okay. they thought the North Koreans going to have their soft come in and it's going to be more of a soft, you know, insurgent fight. And yeah, so yeah. That's my ranger background, you know, with the type of mission. So I went there to help shape their their policy. And it's actually pretty good. You know, they have some things in place. And just on the experience that we have, like, hey, this won't work the way you think it will. We'll probably need to implement these things. And so yeah, uh, yeah. there's foundational and uh, me being able to become a leader and provide that, that again, that contrast, you know, conventional forces and what they think how, how things are. And, you know, the combat, it had guys in combat, but a different combat role. You know, we're doing 60, 70 missions in 120 days, you know, you know direct action combat missions, a lot of experience for us. So, we you know, we bring, we brought that back to the conventional units. That, that was good. So, um, yeah, that's a good so, choice. I mean, that was a no brainer really to put you over there. Right. Um, then you did a year over there. Yeah, a year over there. Yeah. And I did admit, uh, I did a little bit of time at uh, fifth ASOS as a flight leader for a few months, then went to Korea. Okay. Yep. And then, so I won't go to Korea. I went to Heidelberg, Germany. Again, again, first two years in Germany. Now I'm married, you know, so I'm like, man, I had a blast the first two years to the point decade later, like, well, man, should I go back to Germany? You know what I mean? So, yeah. but uh, that's how awesome the first time was, but no, uh, <laughs> I'll leave that story there. But, uh, <laughs> but no, Heidelberg, Germany, fifth core, uh, what's the, you know, so, you know, high echelons, you know, this big management piece, but you know, there's not that many Halo jump masters in Europe. Right, right. And, you know, when you start building partnership capacity for Europe and also some of African countries, uh, to jump out of a U.S. aircraft, you need a U.S. jump master. Yeah. And so a lot of their soft teams, you know, they need to do military free fall. There's only two U.S. free fall jump masters in the country. It was me and a, a PJ. And so nice. uh, we get called to the, to the uh, Type P 4th ASOG, as you will, you know, uh, USAFE or uh, U.S. Army Europe call up, hey, can you go to Romania for a week and do free fall operations? Like, hmm, I think I can. Can you go to Israel? Can you go? I mean, yeah. Oh, can, can you go to these, these, can awesome. you go to these places? Like, uh, I think I could sacrifice for, for a nation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> so I ended up with, uh, I think, eight foreign wings. So I think... Uh, I got the Canadian and Israelis from the Rangers, but I got Romanian, German, Italy, Portuguese, some others uh, when nice. I was in Europe. Uh, but yeah, it's just a good time, man. Call the airstrikes and again, providing that soft perspective we had to now fifth core major combat operations. Again, that compare and contrast, right? Sure. You bring in a different element, but then also me understanding a different element, people teaching me, you know, and those things was pretty successful. And I've spent five years in, in Heidelberg, Germany, uh, traveling, travel to Botswana, again, doing partnership capacity, uh, building a JTAC awesome. program. And, you know, so man, talk about, you know, a great assignment those five years. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, that's awesome. I, I, I when I heard, I know the only guy, because I know most of us who went to Germany, there was like no jump assignment over there. But I think and you and uh, I want to say Rick Weingartner were like the only guys I ever heard of that went over there to, and actually jumped in Germany, which was, and I was like, that's, I was so jealous when I heard you were over there doing that. Especially like Halo. You're like, that wasn't just like static line, you know, you were just like jumping Halo over there. It was so cool. Yeah, I thought that was really awesome. Yeah, when I was at the Rangers, I was the uh, parachute program manager. Oh, okay. So, now, so I understood the rules and, you know, not just yeah. the rules, the DOD rules. So then I got to like, man, I know the rules. This is what it takes to, you know, you can jump based on position or based on experience. And so yeah. based on the experience, man, of stat line jump master, free fall jump master, all these things, the rule books say, hey, you want to keep this person vested and current because of this said money invested. Sure. You know, right. Hey, this is the justification. And oh, by the way, I ran the parachute program for the fourth day saga in Germany. So nice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Sometimes it's good to read the manual. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Your family like it over there? Did they have a good time? Dude, we loved it. You know, we lived in a little German village called Rechtenkeim. You know, we're drinking wine that we watched grow two years ago. Like we yeah. drove through the wine vineyards, you know, now it's bottled. And hey, I watched this wine mature and get developed two years ago. Now, you know, having a glass of it. And my next door neighbor was the, the baker, you know, had one bakery in town. The other neighbor was the wine maker, you know, so you get the bottle of the wine before it's even labeled. And talking about a great experience, my son went to German school. He's speaking oh. German with his English, but he don't know his two different languages. It's just the, oh, nice. right, it's the culture, right? And yeah, we, we traveled all over, you know, hey, can you give us some evals in Italy? Yeah, can I drive? Yeah, no problem. Pack the wife and kids. We stop in Austria or Switzerland on the way down. We stop yeah. in Venice. We go down and do some stuff, drive to Rome, come back up. I mean, it was horrible living. I mean, it was... It was, yeah. it was tough, you know. Uh, four day weekend. I'm glad you got to make the most of it, man. That's, uh, I mean, it's just, it's such a cool. A lot of guys go over there and they don't do that, you know. They don't, they just kind of stay in their little area, which is also, it's okay. But, you know, you got to get out and do stuff too, and expose your your son to it. I mean, that's that's invaluable uh, experience for a kid, you know, just to be a, in to be to see that different cultures and different like, you know, be exposed to different, and not just Germany, but like all those countries. Yeah, that's awesome. He probably kind of like you were. Like when you first went over there as a young guy, he's has that same experience, that same you know worldview now. So that's good. Yeah, that's he's awesome. like, Dad, it sucks. I was there too young. He remembers some things, but he's like super young. But he's been to yeah. twenty two countries. Um, nice. Well, he probably remembers maybe four or five, but he's like <laughs> sixteen. So does he have any uh, aspirations to go back or do anything like that? Oh well, and also, and also, how does he feel about the military? Is he looking towards that, or is he kind of too young for that still? Yeah, so we do want to go back, um, you know, just to rehash some stuff. We want to go back to Fort Lewis as well. He was born, you know, he was born there at uh, at Madigan. Okay. So, you, know, you know, show him where he's from and some roots. Uh, but, yeah, definitely go back to Europe because, again, we love the travel. Sure. Um, he's in junior ROTC right now. Uh -oh. uh, he there wants to go in the military. Um, uh, when I was command chief of a base, uh, he was pilot training. He goes, I think I'm going to be a pilot or a tac P. I said, if you're going to join the military, be a, be a pilot. <laughs> just, yeah. And it's nothing yeah. wrong with Tyke P. I don't want him to do the things that we did. Sure. I know my son. He's not going to join the Air Force and do whatever. He's going to like, hey, how can I get into action? How can I contribute? And right. so it's not a slam on the military. I don't want my son to take the risk that we took. For sure. We, we done it already. Uh, yeah. 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 So I need you to go take this college money. Go go use your brain. So you don't have surgeries and bad back like we do and knee issues and go use your brain and, and go do something else. Right. So, yeah. Plus, if you're going to be the Air Force, frankly, you know, we all know the pilots are the, the focal point of the, of the Air Force. So that's it's a it's a good it's a good career path to go through for sure. If you're going right. to right. join the Air Force, for sure. Right. So um, so you're in Germany for five years. And then what happened after that? Where'd you guys go after that? So horrible, man. Uh, guys were calling me out, calling me out and say, hey, man. Who do you know? I said, I don't know anyone, man. I'm just, just lucky. So I went from Heidelberg to Honolulu. So nice. So <laughs> we, we moved to Hawaii. Um, quick story. I was uh, E7 with an assignment to Hawaii. Line number for E8 is coming out. They say, hey, dude, if you don't make E8, that's bad because you didn't make rank, but you go to Hawaii. If you do make E8, which is good, we're going to can sure Hawaii assignment because it's an E7 assignment you're going to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, luckily guys like uh, Mike Bender and uh, Mac Nugent's like, hey, uh, we still want them regardless. 
And they say, hey, man, you're going to be a senior, senior master sergeant running the flight. I'm like, I really don't care, man. I never chase rank. It's all about experience. I'll be, I'll be flight chief of the Air Force. <laughs> you know? all right. So I got to Hawaii as a master with a line number, uh, pinned on senior master sergeant, uh, running a flight as a senior master sergeant because we had uh, senior Nugent. I think it was senior at the time. Senior Nugent is the op soup. And we had Chief yep. Bender as the squadron soup. Okay. And then Bender went up to be the the uh, career field manager. And then we all shifted to the right. So now I'm op soup. Nice. And then um, Nugent made chief. And then he became the career field manager. And then I f- fleet up. So I got to Hawaii as an E7. I left uh, Hawaii as an E9. Nice. Yeah. Right on. Did you, so did you move up to that? You were the squadron soup at the, when you actually ended up leaving or? Yeah, I did flight chief, op soup, and then squadron superintendent all at the 25th okay. of ASOS. And nice. again, jumping halo, uh, you know, yeah. gone air strikes, heart, heart living. Um, right. I get a, and then from Hawaii was there for, there for five years again. Wow. Really? Yeah. You know, nice. Three years time, I kept, you know, extending, you know. Sure, so, sure. Yeah. Why not? Free Plus, if you're making rank, I mean, it makes sense. You know, why would they, you know, they already have somebody there that can move into that position. So why not keep you there? Yeah. Yeah. And now I'm the chief. I have my own squadron. So why not be the squadron chief of Hawaii? Yeah. So then you did five years in Hawaii. You were the, um, what, what about uh, after that? Where'd you guys go after that? Yeah. So I get an email that says something about you being looked at for a commander involved program to fans Air Force Base. And I call up Matt Nugent, I'm like, hey, man, Air Force bumped their head. I get this automatic email, auto, <laughs> automated email about going to Air Force Base. He laughed, like, yeah, let me go fix that. He calls me back, say, dude, this legit. I don't know what's going on. I get this call from this 06 F-15 Charlie pilot. He goes, hey, I'm a uh, colonel, a uh, full board colonel, so-and-so, so-and-so, uh, commander of the 71st Operations Group. Uh, your name's on the list for commanders of our program. You were one of four people I'm interviewing to fill a position. I say, oh, I appreciate it, sir. You can go from four to three because I don't want it. <laughs> He's like, what do you mean? I say, hey, man. He goes, no, let me tell you about the organization. So pilot training base, right? Um, 600 lieutenants. Uh, teach them how to fly airplanes. And that's the operations group. We have 200 something aircraft, blah, 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 blah. So, hey, it sounds very important, sir, but that's not. I'm jumping halo in Hawaii. Right. My attack piece. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he said, that's what I'm talking about. Is we need that candor, you know, when you operate experience. So I'm not telling you this for you to hire me, you know. All right. You know, I so, said, hey, you know, I'm a chief, right? I'm not going to bitch and complain. Uh, if you want me, we do great things together. But Robert Zachary wants you not hire me so we can do great things separately. <laughs> 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 He's like, all right, I got some more interviews. I get back with you. And about a week and a half later, man, I get an email again, automated. Congratulations, you've been assigned to Vance Air Force Base. I was like, you got to be kidding me. Dude, this sounds like Lindsay when he got interviewed to be a command chief. I mean, he did the same thing. He like, he was like, I'm not interested. I don't want to do it. And I'm telling you, it's the caliber of guys like you and Kenny that are that these people want. I mean, they don't they don't want these cookie cutter, like, you know, knuckleheads. They want these hard charging uh, leaders, you know, these these combat hardened, uh, you know, frankly, badasses that, you know, they want it. They want that that uh, that difference in their squadron. They don't or their group or their wing or whatever. They don't want some, you know, I don't know, some regu- they, they want to change. They want guys like you to come in there and shake it up and give them that P combat veteran, you know, kind of uh, mentality. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's like you, there's nothing you got. You got there's nothing you could have done probably to turn this guy off. He was, the more you tried to get out of it, he wanted you even more after that, I'm sure. Yeah, I think so. And, you know, yeah. he's like, hey, man, I'm a F-15 Charlie guy. You know, he's air to air. So I can't yeah. spell bomb. You know, right. And, yeah. Yeah. And he's like, hey, you know, 15 Charlie guys, we don't deal with enlisted or any, you know, I fly, man. That's what I do. You know, you're like, hey, man, I need somebody to give it to me straight. You know, it's not afraid to talk to an 06, you know, the whole nine yards. So I was like, hey, you know, um, I guess uh, California is not that bad. And it's like, no, 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 no. That's Vandenberg in California. It's like, where's, where's <laughs> Vance? He's like, uh, Oklahoma. Oh, okay. Well, I, I guess Oklahoma City is not that bad. No, 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 no. We're in a place called Enid. You know, it's on the Kansas Oklahoma border. Like it kept getting worse. You know, so yeah. Uh, you know, I got there three months early. Set up things for the family. Flew the family in around January. So the family left Hawaii 
probably 80 something degrees when they when we landed in uh oklahoma it's probably like seven degrees on the ground you know oh, man. my wife's looking at me like you just spoiled her for 10 years and now you're like now yeah. we're in oklahoma yeah yeah i'm about to get a trit it you know <laughs> But back to, again, you know, compare and contrast, man. Um, there's a lot of good people in the Air Force that needs leadership, right? Sure. Those airmen, whatever career field they're in, they're just like us when we we're young. We just happen to be Type P, but we need guidance and all that. And so um, it was refreshing to to just us be us, right? Yeah. And they're like, oh, man, you, you're so great. You're the greatest leader. I'm like, no, I got a, a whole career field of people just like me, right? Yeah. But it's the culture that we grew up in, right? And so it's sure. refreshing to those guys. and. From there, uh, I did two years, and then I was selected to be the command chief for Laughlin Air Force Base in Texas. Nice. Um, did that for two years. Again, eye-opening experience. Uh, man, you know, I, unfortunately, I had some type pieces like, hey, man, you guys are quitting. You guys are sellouts. And, and I'm like, dude, like, you're too old to be that naive. I'm just going to be yeah. frank. You know, there's some guys who are... For sure. And I quit it to like this. It's like a senior airman JTAC saying he's going to change the squadron from the senior airman JTAC position. Like, no, no, you need to be the superintendent of the squadron to change the squadron, to have the ear of the commander. You can't, I don't care how many badges you have, you can't do that at the senior airman JTAC level. Sure. And so our career field complained for so many years about how the Air Force this and the Air Force is that. The way you change that is to have senior enlisted leaders from our career field to have the ear of the 06s, the, the two stars, the three stars, the four stars. So when that four star general, that two star general makes a decision about budgeting, planning, resources, priorities, not our jerk 206 radio, my optic, big picture, how sure. we turn type P to weapon system, all those things that Matt Nugent and Bender and guys was doing, you know, these um, uh, wing and numbered Air Force commanders who's going to make decisions in the Pentagon one day who had tact P's as their right hand person, who they personally selected, giving them perspective. That's how you change the air force. So when it's like, Hey, we need to do this. I remember chief Lindsay or Mark Villela or Robert Zachary, or, uh, um, name all the command chief, Eddie Morales. Right. 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 And this is perspective. Oh, these guys were tact P's. This is what they bring to the table. That's how and why tact P's started to evolve as well working in and up through uh, the career from manager, but all our tech P spreading goodness where these two, three, four uh, star generals are making decisions, but they had tech P's as a reference point and as a mentor, you yeah. know? Yeah. yeah. And so that's how you change it. So like you say, you know, we got, you know, older guys don't mean mature. We got older guys never left the career field, which is okay, but they're bad mouthing guys who did it with no, uh, perspective yeah. whatsoever you know i never understood that like even if they even if you were going to do something which you definitely didn't even if you were going to do something that only served you or whatever like it's it's really none of their business i mean who who i mean there's always it you're not no no one guy is going to bring the, the career field down and on top of everything you guys are not doing that you are going to these command chief positions to like you said to to spread the word about tech p because how else is this going to get elevated how else how else are we going to get advocated for unless you guys go do that and i right. I, I think it's great i mean i mean look at guys like i mean look at marty Plukas who just who you know he he was the the man i mean he was that was the the shiny example of what you can do as, as a you know a command chief so i mean if, if we didn't have guys like you and marty and kenny and you know eddie we would still kind of i think we'd still probably be a little lower like a oh, little out good. of the you know, we wouldn't be where we were today, for sure. Absolutely. Mark Hurst, yeah. all these guys, right? Mark Hurst, for sure. Another just great example, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, and, and, and just to command respect, you know, you know, um, I left, uh, I was going to retire out of uh, Laughlin Air Force Base. And uh, they're like, uh, I knew Joe Bass before she was the chief master in the Air Force, you know. Okay. And uh, she's like, hey, I heard you're going to retire. I'm like, yeah, what's wrong? I'm like, ain't nothing wrong. You know, it's like, oh, you don't want to, how about this wing and that wing? You know, this progression cycle, you know, and sure, sure. perhaps do this. And, you know, maybe in a few years you can, like, I really appreciate that. But I, I don't, you know, that sounds great. But, and uh, I was like, I'm, I'm going to call it quits. You know, I want my son to go to school at one location. I'm going to call it Tampa home. You know, SOCOM, we always go back to SOCOM for schools. You know, had opportunity to go to Jasalsi, which is a nine-month school, three months here in Tampa. 
Then I went to Summit later on, which is a great school, high level, you know, top clearance level education, Chatham House yep. rules. And I like, but Tampa is where it's at. And so I got a call from Greg Smith at the time. He was the uh, SEL of, uh, you know, SOCOM. He's like, hey, man, I heard you retiring. Like, yeah. What's wrong? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Why is everybody asked that? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, let's people think, you know, you know, I, I, quote unquote, like you got just run or something you, or yeah. Yeah, man, you can go to at least numbered Air Force, you know, maybe compete for Matchcom, you know, who knows? You could compete for a chief master on Air Force one day, right? Yeah, yeah. Sure. You know, those conversations was happening, you know, very often. And I was like, dude, I, I appreciate that, but I Dude, with good reason. I mean, I'm telling you, I don't want to stroke you, but with good reason, man. I mean, you would have been a, that's, it, that seems like a natural progression for a guy like you, like, for, especially for you that you, I think you could have been, you know, right up there too. So, so I was going to do four and they years. Know, they knew out. what they were doing. They knew what they were doing. Yeah. I was like, man, this is great. I was going to do four years and get out. So you guys already got an extra credit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but long short, man, he goes, Hey, how about don't get out and move to Tampa? How about peace? Yes, to Tampa. I have some special projects I want you to do here at SOCOM. I think you're a perfect fit for it for all these reasons. And uh, give me give me two and a half years. I said, all right, Greg, give you a year and a half. Uh-huh. <laughs> I said, I'll give you two years, but the last six months I got out. He goes, all right, deal. And so, um, again, another eye-opening event working at the combatant command level, right? Oh, for sure. Right. So calm is the, you know, it's a functional. So we have the world. So we're, yeah. we're both, you know, it's functional, the whole world, but it's, it's uh, geographical because it's the whole world, you know, and so. Yeah. Everything that goes with SOCOM, you know, from our, you know, uh, nuclear influence to in, in, in human domain to we touch everything, right? The most right, lethal, right. the most lethal unit on the planet, right? And get to see that from behind the curtains with all the clearances. Oh, man. Right. You know what I'm saying? I can't imagine the things you were exposed to at that level. I mean, this is crazy. So I was like, man, this is, you know, this is, all, again, man, right place, right time. I stumble into, you know, all these positions and, right. and, uh, but it was great. But back to what I was going to say, you know, about what tech P's bring to the fight. So you have general Clark, four star general of SOCOM, the most lethal organization in the world. Mm-hmm. He's walking down the hall and I have the balls or the stupidity <laughs> to say, how you doing job master? Not four star general Clark, sir. Right. Uh, one, two. Cause I noticed that the master blaster wings, you know how we operate, man. You know, we, we like those titles. We earned that. Right. You know, he was a jump sure. master before he was a four star. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. And he has all his entourage with him. So, you know, he's not walking solo. He got the person with the briefcase and this other person, people. It's like, yeah. you know, doing, jump master. He stopped, he smiled. He goes, how you doing chief? Huh. Huh, Tac P. Two, seven, five. Where's your office? Do we had a, 20 minute impromptu conversation. Nice. Right. So talk about representation. Yeah. Right. To not have the either balls or stupidity to call him jump master, but either hey, way. Either way, like, hey, huh, Tac P, I know what Tac P's bring to the table because he grew up in the Ranger Regiment. Yep. As a young officer. Right, right. So that that Tac P, what we represent as career field, meant something. But then he saw that we did that as TAC P's uh, at the Ranger Battalion. He knows the value that we bring to the battlefield. And it wasn't right. some guy in the rear in the gear. We were on the X. And so right. that respect, right? Four-star general, but he respects that. Yeah. And so those are the conversations where now I have a door to him, uh, Admiral Shermansky, who was the uh, uh, deputy commander. So three-star equivalent Admiral, Navy SEAL type. Hey. Zach, anytime, come here. Let's talk about whatever. That's not Zach coming. That's a Air Force Tac P talking to a Navy SEAL three star who stood up all the cool guy programs is on the East Coast, right? He's right, right. That's that's the exposure. Yeah. You tell me what you need, right? That's why Tac P's need to leave the career field to have these conversations, you know. And now Admiral Green, who's the three star um, um, uh, deputy commander, who was the chief of staff. Another good story. I'm sitting in staff meeting with all the generals, two, three are listed in there because my programs that I'm running. And uh, I'm looking at this two star. He's looking at me like this. This guy looks familiar. And then I said, Sir? He goes, Huh? He was a captain in 275 when I was staff sergeant. Really? Now he's the chief of staff of SOCOM, two star. 
Jeez. Right. Don't tell me that Tyke P is not, you know, making headway within the command, you know, but For you sure. can't do that. You can't do that from, from the third ASOG. Right. You got to leave the career field. You know what I mean? So, yeah, just, just refreshing those guys' memory of tech P's, you know, seeing a guy like you walking through the hallway, they're like, Oh yeah, that's right. You know, and then it refreshes that it keeps it fresh in their head that way when they're thinking about ops or they're thinking about whatever it is, money or their the tech P will be in their, in their cross check when they're doing that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. So then you, you did two, you gave him two years, a year and a half without yeah, processing. Two years and, 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 uh, and you just got out recently too, right? Yeah. yeah. Retired on 24th February. That's right. Sorry, I couldn't make it, man. It's hard to get out of here and get anywhere. But congratulations on that. I mean, it's well deserved. I mean, you you definitely have done your time and you've given a lot to the military and the career field. So, man, congratulations on that. That's awesome. Man, I love every minute of it. It wasn't like it was yeah. a tour. You know what I'm saying? We were having yeah, a right. blast. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to figure it out, man. I'm not stumble over myself. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Um, so I kind of want to touch on a couple of things uh, before we get off here. Um, we were going to talk about... Um, we have been talking about leadership all the way through. We kind of been, you know, you've kind of been talking, giving us some guidance, but do you have anything that you, as a chief, as a command chief, as somebody who's been at the highest levels of the military can impart to anybody who's listening or any, like, uh, any words of wisdom other than what you've already passed on? Do you have like any nuggets that, you know, people can use to, you know, maybe further their career more than they, they would have if they hadn't? No, absolutely. And I was saying before, you know, opinions are like buttholes. Everybody got one. So sure, sure. Look, Some are better yeah, than others though, you know. Yeah, you know, of course I have words of wisdom. Let me pontificate, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but no, uh, you know, uh, several things, but I always tell guys, you know, hey man, I go into organizations and hey, how can I be, become a command chief? How can I, you know, get to that level, you know? And first I tell them, you know, don't expire to that. Just be great where you at and, and progress through, you know, but the goal shouldn't be this, you know, this position, right? Season where you're at. But they ask, you know, what's the secret to having a great career? And they don't expect this answer, but I think it's true. I say, who you marry and who you have kids with are the most important decisions you will make for your military or any other profession. Yeah. Because when you're having a sucky day, and do you need to give extra at the job? Are you thinking about, hey, I have a support system at home or I'm going to catch hell when I go home? Right. When you're on the X, knowing the mission is the family dynamics breaking down and the kids, what, and, you know, where's, where's mama at and what she's spending? Or do you have that clarity of mind to focus on the mission? You know, everything's good. So I tell guys and gals who you marry and who you have kids with is the most important decision of your professional career. And hopefully that's the same person. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. And, Optimally, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, no, no, nothing's perfect. You know, I'm not saying try to be perfect or, you know, if you, if that's, if uh, you have a divorce or what, that's not the case, that's something wrong with you. Um, you ask me the question, they ask me the question, what's the most important advice I can tell? I said, that is the most important advice. Who you marry and who you have kids with, that's the most important decision of your military career as far as setting the foundation and that, but, um, that's great advice. I mean, the last thing you need is distractions or I, that's, I, I never really thought about it like that. Like, that's a good way to put it. Like you don't want, you want somebody who's got your back. You don't have, you already have the stress of the job and, and maybe combat or whatever, but you, so you don't need extra stress at home. You know, you need to come into a friendly place and kind of de decompress as opposed to coming into another battle at the house. You know, that's a well said. You know, for sure. And I also say, you know, don't, don't let your experience be your crutch. You know, we have guys who they have experience, but they're still closed minded. And I mean by that, uh, you know, we talk about guys go to Germany, never left the base camp, you know, go to the PX and back into the to dorms and say, Europe sucks. And so now right. they're using their non-experience of being in Europe and never experienced Europe to shape their worldview on everything else. And they use that as the gospel. Hey, I have the experience of this, you know, so we see this a lot in, you know, in the media, we see this a lot, you know, with our politicians, we see this a lot with our military leaders within our type B's where, you know, they had the opportunity and been in places to do things to gain an experience, but for whatever reason, they were there, but they weren't present, you know, yeah. uh, comments of command chief, you know, was telling the airmen, they moved in, but they haven't moved in, you know, go walk around the dorms, call their life and you see the airmen, they're there or in present, but there's nothing on the walls. They got a bed, whatever. They're there physically, but they haven't moved in. Mm -hmm. they're, they're somewhere else. They're back home, which they were there, or they're waiting for the next assignment. And when right. you're not present, you know, that's a, that's, that's a problem. You know, what's going on with you? 
uh, but you have the other airmen and they decorate it. You know, it's all good to go. They're there, but they're also there, you know, so they yeah, move, yeah. They'll move in. So that, and then the last thing I'll say is threefold is, um, you know, three things is love, humility, and receipts. Um, to be great at something, you got to love it. And the love can come from a whole host of different reasons. You love it because the accolades you're going to get and the ribbons and, you know, the badges, you know, the bona fides, or you okay. love the mission, which I think we did. It was all about the mission. How can I get better? Or you love who you're doing it with. You know, the guys at the 14th thing sauce, the guys at the Rangers, or why are you doing the mission? But somewhere in that equation, you have to have love to, to, mm-hmm. to go be from being okay to, you know, to be awesome. Again, in my humble opinion. Uh, and then I said the humility, you know, it's not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking less about yourself, right? And that humility will allow you to accept criticism. You know, we have a lot of people who, and I just talk about our, our career field, you know, our social media pages where, you know, it's all my optic and, you know, we're growing, this side can do no wrong and this side is always, it's always right. And that's not, that's, that's blind and it's ignorant. And it's very, um, uh, very immature in your thought process. But the humility, once you have that, Hey, let me check my, my, my dominant logic. Let me check my, my beliefs, yeah. right? You know, so you have your external beliefs and you have your internal convictions. Where do those come from? So humility allow you to, to, to be open to something. And you may not change, but at least you looked at it, you analyzed and say, hey, uh, I see what you're saying, but I disagree. That's okay. Yeah. But if you don't never get to that point, you know, uh, I, I don't think you can be a, a, a great leader uh, without having, you know, humility uh, as, a, as a leader. Um, sure. And the last thing it says, receipts, man, what's your body of work? You know, guys talk talk all the game. You see people on social media, hey, follow my 12-step leadership guidebook and all that. Like, well, you never led before, you know. Yeah. The people confuse being polished or being popular, you know, for being a revit, you know, to, to what you're talking about, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, being polished with professionalism, you know, being polished with being a professional, you know, where are right. your receipts? Right. What's your body of work? Have you earned my my time in my ear? You know, so your body of work, what's your experience? You know, academics too, training versus education. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, we got a lot of badges, but what's your thought process? Because Halo School and Ranger School and Pathfinder School is cool, but when you have the level where you're making critical decisions, it's not your training is going to get you through, it's your education. How do you have critical thought and think through these things? So for us advice as we go through the cool guy schools and we start tackling these hard positions at the combat command level at the command chief level it's not about the bona fides in your chest what's your thought process and how do you compartmentalize analyze and come to new conclusions based on the data that you receive so these skills don't happen overnight it takes time to develop and then lastly your mental is comes for body work your mental elasticity right how can you stretch your myoptic? I mean, you're going to stay there and you have the same conclusions, but how can you stretch mentally to, to look at things? Well, I can go on on about, about leadership, you know, because, you know, we talk about what's next is, is you know, I have a, a leadership company. I hate using that word leadership company because everyone has a leadership company. Sure. Uh, but <laughs> but focus on strategic thinking and operational problem solving. Right? Okay. We're going to organi- organizational design, organizational development, you know, ethics, you know, all these things, but how do we think strategically and how do we problem solve for the operation? And okay. so we have businesses and frameworks and, you know, based on my undergrad as a uh, international relations, um, all the military schools with JSOC, JSAL, Summit, those things, high level uh, Chatham House rules, and then my master studies uh, with strategic leadership and then some other courses I'll be being able to attend, you know, as a command chief from, you know, University of North Carolina, uh, Chapel Hill, uh, got to attend some MIT courses while, or a MIT course while here at SOCOM. So again, uh, nice. how, how, how do we transfer, you know, the cool guy trigger pull into to, uh, the thought process? Because this is a, not a war of attrition. This is a war of cognition. Russia and China, war of cognition. Yeah. Um, and I believe our country can be defeated without pulling the trigger uh, if our population is not educated and cognitive of what's going on. So, uh, sure. yeah. So, yeah, I'll leave it at that, man. I'll, I'll talk. So what's the name? What's the name of your company? 
So uh, Primer yeah. Development Group. Uh, I got my hat on here. Uh, Seth, this okay. plug here. Uh, Cause I'm unemployed, you know, I turned down jobs to, to, to leave my company. So I'm going to plug my company, but uh, yeah, primer development comp, uh, primer development group. Uh, the website is primer P R I M E R D G.com. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Zach, I can't thank you enough for doing this, man. That, that, that was a great wrap up. I, I, I don't have anything to add. That was perfect. Um, uh, and I definitely want to hear about, you know, I'll to have you on again to tell me about all that two seven five stuff. I'm sure that's a, a couple hours of, of material there. Um, 10% yeah, right I, on 10% is true. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> no, but man, I, I, I'm really impressed with you. I've always have been. And, uh, you know, just the things you've done and, uh, and where you ended up was just phenomenal. I mean, to be, to end up at SOCOM and that kind of level is just, is really cool. I'm, I'm really happy for you. And, um, congratulations on the retirement and, uh, yeah, thanks again for coming on. I can't thank you enough. I, hey, thanks for asking me, but also as large, thanks for doing this for the career field. You know what I'm saying? And, oh yeah. And uh, like I said, man, you know, JD Welsh is one of those names, you know, there's certain names out there when you hear like, yeah, that's a good dude. Right. And, or, sure. or, or also, you know, where's the receipts, right? Right. right. That the guys yeah. who talk the talk, you have to walk the walk. Hey man, JD, oh, yeah, I know JD or three, seven, five. Right. So man, it's good catching up with you after all these years you too. and too, too long. And thanks for doing this brother. Love you, man. Yeah. All right, man. Love you too. I'll, uh, I'll reach back out to you for another one, uh, in the future. Sure. Sure, man. All right, brother. If, if you're willing, if you're willing, I don't well, know. Of course. You're a busy dude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. I think, uh, me talking a lot, there's no, there's no problem with that. Oh no. Yeah. That, <laughs> it, it was perfect. I, this is awesome. I can't thank you enough. All right, brother. Hey, take care of yourself, All right. man. All right, man. Hey!